This episode is part two of our four-part series leading up to the launch of my new book. The data sleuth process I lay out in the book is what I wish I had had when I started Workman Forensics in 2010. Whether you're new to the industry, wondering where to start, or maybe even wrestling with how to scale a service that seems unscalable, I believe the information in this book can help. The book is available now for pre-order. Pre-orders are what publishers use to determine how many books to order. So if you enjoy the content in today's episode, would you consider pre-ordering the book today? Stay tuned at the end of the show for more detail on the Data Sleuth book or see the show notes to reserve your copy today. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. I'm your host, Leah Wheatholter, CEO and founder of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Today I have with me one of the team members again. I have Rachel Organist. She's our senior data analyst. Originally trained as a geologist, Rachel obtained a Bachelor of Science from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and a Master of Science from Penn State University. When her work in the oil and gas industry didn't provide the career satisfaction she was looking for, she researched other fields and found forensic accounting to be the perfect place to apply her analytical skills. In her work with Workman Forensics, Rachel uses her expertise in scientific reasoning as well as her aptitude for identifying, collecting, and synthesizing data to undertake financial investigations. As of 2021, Rachel is an official certified fraud examiner. So thanks so much for joining me today, Rachel. I am so excited to be here. I know you are because (laughs) we're going to talk about like one of your favorite things. I think you have several favorite things though. But I do, but this is definitely one of them. And I would say this is one of my favorite things, but not for the same reason. So our topic today is case planning. And the title is case planning is the key to the data sleuth process. And so for me, case plan from my perspective, case planning is what saved my life and made sure that I didn't burn out and quit this career like six years ago <laughs> um, or five years ago. Case planning made it where we could all communicate on projects and like divide up the projects and all that. And so we'll talk about all those details. But for me, this is what kept Workman Forensics in business. (laughs) So that's why I love case planning. I just love it because it's fun. Right. Okay. That's great. We're not going to talk about it from an owner's perspective today. Let's talk about it for just our general audience. Like why is case planning important for investigators? So first of all, just a side thought that I just had about case planning and why like I feel like some people might love it and some people might find this to be like kind of the boring or like the less exciting part of the investigation process. You know, it's not like when you're really digging in and doing the analysis and doing the research and like uncovering fun stuff. Like I feel like a lot of people love that part. It's almost like, you know, some people hate to read the instructions before they like assemble assemble a piece of Ikea furniture or yep. whatever. I'm like a huge instructions reader. So I love to just like get that big picture out of the way up front and like see where I'm going to end up. And so I think if you enjoy that, you too will fall in love with case planning. Um, But even if you don't, Just take it from us that it is super essential. I mean, we'll kind of go through the reasons that it is the key to the data sleuth process. But I would say the main reasons that it's so important for investigators is it's what's going to keep you focused on that end goal and not getting lost in the weeds. So I kind of sound like a broken record here, but that's just because that's, I feel like, a really high risk, especially for a lot of investigators who do tend to, like, we probably tend to be, like, really curious people by nature. Um, And so it's easy to kind of follow your own curiosity and just keep doing the parts of the investigation that are, like, really fun. But with a case plan, you're going to stay focused on that end goal. What does the client actually need from you? What's going to add value for them and not go down those rabbit trails? It definitely helps you keep asking yourself, why am I doing this task for every task that you do? So that's going to keep costs down for clients while getting them all the answers that they want. If those answers are possible to get, you know, within reason, it kind of ensures that the analysis that you're doing is going to help meet your client's goals. Often that's going to be quantifying a loss and identifying benefit to the subject because those are going to be components of a fraud. But, you know, it could be a little different depending on the case you're looking at. But um, having a case plan is going to help you keep each analysis that you're doing aligned with whatever those goals are. One of the things that I love, I think is just really saves a lot of time and money and heartache down the road is it can, a good case plan can help you anticipate data availability issues and analysis issues that are going to come up later. I mean, there are always going to be surprises or wrenches that get thrown into things. But if you really put the effort to like see what data you have and kind of think through what you want to do with it at the outset, that just is much easier. You don't want to end up telling the client you can do something and then you find out that the data they have available is not 
you know, sometimes you can get really creative and answer their question with bad data, but sometimes it just might not be possible. So a good case plan, I think, is going to help you identify those issues as early in the process as possible, which is just good for everyone. That also keeps the case moving. I feel like we've honestly always had a good case planning process since I got here three years ago. Like you guys were kind of already doing it, but I do feel like we've gotten better and better at this. And I just think I've heard like Leah and Megan say that earlier we would have more of an issue with everyone's like working along and then, oh shoot, I open up this spreadsheet that I was going to join to this other spreadsheet and it doesn't actually have what I need or, you Mm -hmm. know, we're missing three random months of bank statements in like a really important time period or whatever. And so a case plan is going to help you get those issues addressed earlier. So work doesn't have to like grind to a halt. It's just a lot more time efficient. And especially as our caseload has grown, if you're juggling multiple cases, that is it's essential to know that you have what you need up front and not kind of run into that stuff last minute. And then finally, if this isn't enough of a sales pitch, I think a huge (laughs) benefit of a good case plan is that it's a tool for making sure that as an investigator, you are on the same page as the client and or their attorney. And I always think of, we had like a pretty unique case involving a school district. And for that one, it was just, when we planned it, it felt like a little outside our wheelhouse. And I later in the case came to feel like, no, this is a perfect case for us but it wasn't like immediately obvious why it was. But our initial plan, we sent back to them and we're like, hey, you know, here's what we're going to do for you. And the attorney was like, this isn't what we want. (laughs) You know, it's completely wrong. Like, I don't think I've ever been completely wrong. None of the concerns. She was like, no, you said we were concerned about like A, B, and C, but like, actually it's X, Y, and Z. And we're like, I'm glad that we had this conversation now. (laughs) Which I, I... Yeah, I hadn't thought about this case before we started recording, but what we gave them was exactly what they told us they were concerned about. I think this is another thing that's great about the case plan is that a lot of times like clients don't even really know what they want or like they think they know, but until if you then like kind of spell it back to them in this more organized way, like, okay, we think you are interested in finding the answer to this, this, and this, and here's what we're going to do to find it. Only once they see it kind of put in that framework, they can say, oh, that's not... No. And they still might not even know what they want. It's kind of like when someone in your family is like, ooh, I don't really want to eat at this restaurant you suggested, but they don't like give you (laughs) another suggestion. Like clients, it's okay that they do this, but a lot of times they do that. You know, they're like, oh, this isn't what I want, but I don't know what I do want. But I feel like the case plan process can be like an awesome communication tool for making sure that you guys are on the same page, helping them clarify what their goals are, because you're kind of making them set a goal at the beginning. Instead of just saying, we're going to investigate, which is just not going to be a great use of resources. Something else that I honestly had not thought of until something you just said about all your favorite things about case planning is that it allows us like knowing that we have this process that we're about to walk through step by step. But knowing that we have this case planning process, it allows us, I think, to be more creative about the investigations that we can actually take on. So it doesn't have to fit within the four corners of like an embezzlement investigation. And the client doesn't have to know how somebody stole, but then it doesn't have to feel like giving somebody a blank check to investigate every area of their business that, I mean, this goes back to the risk-based analysis, but you know, every area that has a risk to make sure, like it provides this organized framework like you talked about, but then we can take cases like this one with the school district that I think before case planning, I would have been like, yeah, I think we can probably figure out analysis to do that. But I just usually know that whatever the client is coming, like it doesn't even have to be financial information. In that case, it was not. There was like no financial data in that case, I think. Yeah, not really. It was like comparing contracts. Right. It, But it was an investigation. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really this process empowers an investigator to say, okay, this is really a framework for solving problems for clients in an exploratory way, but with structure so that, and this is the part, I know I said I wouldn't talk about this as a business owner, but I can't help it, but it reduces the risk of client dissatisfaction. It reduces the risk of bad Google reviews. Um, It reduces the risk of non-payment. And so, and all of those things are important in order to stay in business. We've been in business 11 years now. I mean, it was, it's been touch and go, (laughs) touch and go a few times in the past, but this is what really made it like, oh my gosh, we can answer 
clients' questions. And then I think that fine line sometimes for testifying experts is, yeah, but I can't be hired to say what the client wants me to say. But this framework allows us to say, okay, we're going to take your problem, your concern, your questions, and we're going to create a plan to address those things and give you the results of those findings. And it may not be what you want it to be. We're not promising that. That's a great point too. Another thing that I love about it is it's an excellent framework for Because, yeah, I could see how a lot of people might say like, well, how do you reconcile providing fantastic client service with the fact that you are need to be this impartial third party? And to me, those things aren't contradictory at all, because I see every day how we execute these case plans that do exactly that. But like, I could see how that could be a concern. But this kind of helps you make sure that like you are addressing what the client wants you to address, but you're still doing it in a neutral way exploratory or neutrally. You're not just like getting the client thing. You are answering the questions the client wants you to answer. You're not necessarily getting the answers the client wants you to get, if that makes yes. sense. Yes. And we'll talk about this in a couple of episodes following this one about the different analyses that we perform and the data sets we look at. Like when they ask us, when they tell us what their concerns are or what question they want answered, we're not agreeing with them and then going and finding data that agrees with them, we're finding a data set that we can analyze to then see, are there indicators in this data set as a whole for the entire period that will then answer their question? Did someone, did an employee take money that benefited them directly instead of the company? You know, and so we'll get into more of that. But everything starts with our risk-based analysis, which is why we recorded that one first, that episode first. So go back and listen to it if you like, so that that can kind of set up this case planning. And then now we're going to talk about case planning today. And when I wrote the book, I'm not going to lie, I struggled to like tell people exactly how this works because I'm so proud of it. Like, And some people said, I can't believe you're going to actually tell people your secret sauce. But if we, I think our analyses are awesome. Like I think we have simplified financial investigations through using data amazingly, especially with the tools that are available today in 2022. I think the secret sauce is our case planning. 100%. All right. Let's share. You guys are so lucky to be (laughs) hearing this right now. I just can't even tell you. No. It's going to change your life. It it changed mine. I'm joking, Um, but like I'm not joking. No, I didn't even think you were joking because that's how much I believe it. (laughs) I want to go through the steps to our data sleuth case planning process with you, Rachel. We talked about client intake, or I did, with Megan in a couple couple episodes ago. That's really where a case starts. Then we go into risk-based analysis as kind of part of that conversation, but then it bleeds over into this case planning. But what are those actual steps? I mean, what does that, what does it look like at Workman Forensics? Like Megan brings, a, someone will call, she has a client intake call or Justin now is on our team. They'll, they'll take a new client call, they'll get the information. And then the client says, yes, I want to move forward. And we do all the engagement letter, da, 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 da. And then she schedules what we call our case planning workshop. When that happens, what does that look like? What does the workshop look like? And then what is that process within that workshop? So something that I think is pretty cool and pretty central to the idea of if you're going to do this as a team, obviously, if you are just like a sole proprietor, you can totally use case planning too, and you 100% should. Um, But if you want to use it as a tool to get a team working together, I think it's pretty neat that we, everyone is in the case planning workshop that is sometimes even if we know someone is not probably going to work this case because they're full or, you know, it's just a really small case. Usually they'll still be in the case planning workshop because it's just, you know, we kind of want like maximum availability of ideas. And even like our data processing specialist or someone who's probably only going to work on the data processing side of things, it's really valuable for them to be in the workshop too, for a lot of reasons, they will probably have some insight, you know, if we have questions about like, ooh, like if all they have available is this kind of data, you know, is that going to be budget efficient to work on? Or, you know, we might have strictly data processing related questions, but I also think it's really beneficial to have those people involved because as they're going through the data processing, sometimes there's kind of like judgment calls or you just might choose to do things differently if you have a sense of the bigger picture of the case and like what the analyst is going to be looking for. I mean, we work together really closely throughout that process too to answer those kinds of questions, but I do just think it's really valuable, you know, for everyone to be involved in case planning for those kinds of reasons. So then we have everyone in this workshop. We have our case planning worksheet, which is also in the book. 
and mm-hmm. maybe online. It's only in the book. You it's only in the book. the book. Buy the and book. Then get the, but there is a download that comes with the books. But yeah, no, I don't give away the secret sauce for free. You have to buy the book. I mean, this is like really good secret sauce. So we get our case planning worksheet out. You know, we all hop on a call. And the first step has kind of already been started by whoever's been in contact with the client. So one of our case managers, and they'll outline what the client's concerns are based on, you know, their discussions with the client. And then the next column, and I was just thinking about this a minute ago when we were talking about kind of how do you balance great client service, but not just telling the client what they want to hear. I think this step is really key and it's kind of a newer evolution and like how we talk about the case plan, but we take those client concerns and we translate them into workman investigation priorities. And I think that the language that you use here is really important. Um, So even when it was just client concerns, one thing that I've talked about before in trainings is and I also like harp on this, like everyone is probably sick of me in case planning workshops because I'm always like, eh, can we rephrase that? Um, Because I don't want And now like the client concerns that now that we have that as a separate column, I think that can kind of be a little fuzzier. I mean, it's truly just like, what is the client concerned about? What do they want to see that we're going to address? But if you're talking about like, what are your investigation priorities? I think they really need to be like action words. I mean, you need to, are you quantifying something? Are you identifying something? Are you determining whether something is true or reconciled or like, what are you doing? So it's like, what are you going to do? kind of sometimes worked in there gets like what question is it answering or you know it should be clear how that does address the client concern or how the two tie together and then I also think that like going through that process is why this is so great for keeping you neutral is like your investigation priority is never going to be something like show that so-and-so took the money. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I'm thinking of that uh, you'll know what case I'm talking about here too where it's like show that it was these temporary employees responsible for the inventory loss and not our full-time employees because then our insurance will pay for it. (laughs) You know, sometimes the client has a real clear idea of what's going to happen or what has been happening, but your investigation priority, you shouldn't phrase it in a way that leads you to a certain answer. It should be more like tasks are we going to perform to get an answer to this question. I think if we did have like a drop down box for the investigation priorities in our worksheet, it would be like the action words. It would be quantify, determine, verify, or identify whether or not, or reconcile. Like those are probably the top four words that we use all the time. Which is crazy because it's like our cases are so diverse, but truly like most things break down into like you are doing one of those things. Mm -hmm. It's not that complicated. No, really not. (laughs) So yeah, I think that step is really key. I also think that is kind of the trickiest step, or at least it takes the most practice, both because you're trying to frame everything in that very like objective and action-oriented mindset, but also um, kind of seeing through – I don't know if red herrings is the right term because they're very unintentional, but a lot of times the straight up client concerns or like notes from client discussions can be full of basically red herrings. You know, they can get really hung up on like a specific detail or this one specific payment or whatever when that's not really like we're not going to build a whole analysis around one check that they know she wrote to so-and-so or whatever. I mean, that might be something we make a note of. And like, yeah, when we go through the bank statements and analyze them, we will keep an eye out for like this type of thing. I think kind of sorting through those like details that are very important to the client, but not necessarily going to make up a big part of your analysis is like a key part of that translation to the investigation priorities. I agree. So we do that. Then the next step, or it's not really in sequence like that, but kind of the next column in the worksheet and something we're always thinking about is uh, just questions that come up for the client because no matter how thorough your initial conversation was, there will always be more things once you really start, even if you're doing this by yourself, again, once you really start thinking through how you want to build the investigation, there will be more things that you want to ask them. So noting that. And then we move on to kind of just a drilling down at the next level or getting even more specific than those investigation priorities. You know, we might say that we want to quantify expenditures that didn't benefit 
the state or whatever. Um, but what does that look like? You know, what analysis are we going to do? And so we have some different in-house standard analyses that we always have in our pocket. And I think we will talk about those in an upcoming episode. So that'll be fun. Um, but sometimes we have to come up with stuff that's, you know, a little more custom or get a little bit more creative depending on what the case needs. And so that'll be kind of the next thing that we think about. And then in tandem with that, it's what data or documentation do you need to perform those analyses? And then that's the basis of our document request list that goes out to the client. Yeah. So on that data piece, I think one thing that as I've talked to other investigators about it or even added people to our team or working with some other professionals on some cases what you said, it's it's exactly how we do it, but I want to make the distinction. You said, then we identify the data we need. We don't ask the client, send us all your financial information. We're going to sort through this, and then we're going to create a plan based on what you have. We create it based on what we need. Like, I want to start with the most ideal list of information and the best evidence in that initial document list. And that comes from the analyses that we know in order to quantify, we need to do these things. And to do these things, we need these sources of information. And then that way we're starting with the best list. And I've actually been able to, this was many, many years ago, but I created that list for a client The client sent me nothing I asked for and just what she thought I needed. And I said, I can't use this. You need to send me everything. We kind of went back and forth. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Blah, blah, blah. And then it hit me. Oh, she doesn't want to provide me with the information I've asked for because she wants me to provide her narrative. She wants me to rubber stamp her narrative. And that's once again, by determining what data do we need to process this? And starting with the most ideal, like the highest list of information, then we can identify, we can always make adjustments based on what the client has. But let's ask, ask for the best case scenario. And I think a really good example of this one was when there were some potential fake vendors and like, yeah, mainly fake vendors, but like some purchasing issues within a company. And we sent them okay, this would be the most ideal information to perform these tasks and to address your concerns. And they came back and they said, we just realized our system doesn't keep these things. And so it actually helped us as investigators to not look like we didn't know what we were doing, but it helped them highlight, oh man, we had never even thought about tracking this. And they were really a large organization that should have been tracking this because they There was no way to audit anything because they didn't have certain functions turned on. And so then that also helped us. It just changed the focus of our scope. Okay, well, if you don't have these things, then going forward, this is how you can improve these things. Yeah. Or sometimes we can say, well, we can back into it. It's not ideal, but we can back into it because you do have these other two data sources. But yeah, in that case, it's like, well, it was kind of unsatisfying, but there was a value add for them like pretty early on by them realizing, wow, we really need to upgrade our processes and the way we're tracking this data. And I think it's more frustrating to start with the data dump from the client and think that that's all they have and later say, well, we could have done more with this had we had, and they said, and then they go, oh, we had that. Oh my gosh. So let's just start with what would be our dream list to do all of this analysis with the client. And then they know up front, these are the things we need. Hi everyone, it's Leah. My new book, Data Sleuth, Using Data in Forensic Accounting Engagements and Fraud Investigations, launches April 19th. And to celebrate, we're giving away 10 signed copies during each of our April 5th and April 19th episodes. With 20 chances to win, you do not want to miss out. To be sure you're in the drawing, subscribe to the podcast and turn on alerts to be the first to know when the episodes drop. Now, something that came up recently in a like a new client call actually uh, created this next question for you. How are we able to even create a case plan without reviewing the docu- the documentation from the client? Yeah. So I think this is an interesting. It's one of those questions that like wouldn't have occurred to me until a client asked it because it's like, oh, well, we just do this. We do it all the time. But I Mm-mm. thought about it and I think – Kind of the main reason it works is that basically every case that we work, as diverse as they all are, which we've talked about multiple times, can be can be viewed through just like a couple of 
frameworks, and we use that word all the time, one is the what happened versus what should have happened. That's a question that we apply to almost every case. And something that's like similar, sometimes the same thing, sometimes it's not, is where did money come from and where did it go? And as long as you can look at a case in one of those two ways, like they're kind of all the same. You know, the data sets that you're going to be looking at to answer those questions are going to be different for different cases, but essentially every client concern boils down to one or both of those questions. And so I think that's really the answer. You know, we're just applying the same framework to every case. And um, as long as the client is upfront with us about, you know, their processes and the information that's available and what their concerns are, which they are, we can usually, well, we can always put it into a, a investigation plan that we're going to work. And this is an ongoing process. We don't just set the case plan and then say, this is what we're going to do for you. Like this is iterative, collaborative with the client. Yes. Yeah. That's not to say that we just write a case plan and they sign it and it never evolves and concerns never get dropped or added because they do all the time. And so I guess that's important for the client to know too. Like, you're going to prove this. We're going to start working on it. But as we go, you know, you might uncover more things. We might uncover things that, or we might find out that, you know, you thought you had this data available, but really it's not available. And so we can't really address this concern. We definitely adjust as we go along. And I've noticed lately in several of our case planning workshops, we've kind of started saying, okay, we would want to do this kind of analysis, but based on what we get there, we kind of need to make this to be determined analysis because we know there might be another step where we need to circle back up again and do a second workshop, which seems most common when our client has very little control. That seems to be like kind of the indicator right now that could change. But um, we've been kind of having to add that little TBD to our case plan. Which normally I would hate because I just feel like that's not my personality, but I kind of like it because it's just embracing reality and it feels better to do it up front than to think like, here's our case plan, go. And then we're working it. And then I realize like these two data sets like do not reconcile and we actually did expect them to, or, you know, this, the results of this analysis were like not even close to what we thought it was going to be. Um, so that totally affects what we were going to do next. It's kind of nice to like build that in and know we're probably going to have to regroup, you know, after we do items one and two to kind of decide how we want to go with item three. Yeah, that's definitely, I like that we've started doing that. We didn't really talk about it. We just started doing it. And then I wanted to just take a minute before we talk about an example, but I wanted to just take a minute on the sole proprietor issue or like a single investigator, you know, there was a period of time that I did not have employees, maybe like one year. And I started thinking, well, how did I plan for these cases when I was just by myself? And there's just no way you can know any, everything about everything, right? Like in these workshops, it's so great because someone has their, depending on their experience, like now we have Justin on the team and he's very fresh out of audit and he'll say, well, what if we looked at it this way? And I'm like, oh, we haven't considered looking at this this way in a while. And then we have this discussion. So that's just so valuable. So I thought about what did I do as a sole proprietor working cases by myself that I would get to where I felt like, okay, I've got a comprehensive case plan for a client without that team setting. And I think I just created pseudo teams. I would think to myself, okay, this is what the client needs me to address. This is what I want to do. This is the information I need. I mean, everything that we've talked about. But then if I had a concern that I just wasn't familiar with, I would reach out to somebody and then I would tell them the case story and then they would go, oh, well, did you think about doing this? Or then they would start asking questions and I would go, oh, I need to go ask the client about that question. So I kind of created my own collab like collaborative back then to make sure that I had thought about this, you know, and I think you could probably do it with some attorneys, but I don't know. I, I think talking to another forensic accountant or fraud investigator or somebody with a lot of experience, that's just really helpful. So even if you work by yourself, I don't want you to think that you can't do this case planning process because I absolutely did. Yeah, that's really cool. Use your network. All right. Do you have a case example uh, that, that we've worked where you could take a client's concerns and like illustrate how those break down into our investigative priorities and how does that actually break down into a case plan? Yeah. So I am thinking of a case that we worked uh, a couple of years ago, I think maybe two, that was a pretty straightforward embezzlement case. I think it was a pretty small business and I don't think he had a lot of employees or at least not like, you know, full-time main office type employees, but the business owner who was our client did have this one woman who had done um, basically all of his bookkeeping and uh, general management. Uh, those types of things. She, I believe she actually 
confess to him. But I think what first came to his attention, and she had confessed before he ever even came to us. So he comes to us with a story. He says, you know, I noticed some things in QuickBooks that were not right. Um, Some checks that had just been like hanging out, like not cleared or some customer deposits. I think maybe some of each that were just like not cleared in QuickBooks for like multiple years. And then, you know, he started digging around a little bit more and questioned this employee and she confessed to him that she had been using company funds for her own personal benefit. So that's kind of the story that he came to us with. And what I just think is a good example in this case is that's kind of the turning case drama into a case plan aspect. You know, he had certain things. He was like really concerned about these QuickBooks entries, but we kind of zeroed in on, I mean, because this is, this type of case is really like, I don't want to say our bread and butter anymore because I feel like now we're really into like the more complex cases, but this is the type of case that's like just the stereotypical data sleuth process works awesome for like these kinds of embezzlements. So we immediately were like, well, we just need to, you know, quantify the funds that were used not for the benefit of his company, basically, and that's the loss. And so that's like concern number one and investigation priority number one, and then concern number two. So that's kind of the the meat and potatoes of the case, quantifying the loss. And we'll talk about the analyses that we were going to use to get there. And then concern number two was kind of a secondary thing, identifying whether these uncleared checks and deposits in QuickBooks were related to the embezzlement at all, or were they just, you know, mistakes, because she also just wasn't a very good bookkeeper. And that aspect of it, and I guess this is something we didn't really talk about in this episode, but if what we're primarily usually trying to do in these cases is identify the loss or the benefit. The other thing we like to try to do is identify or kind of tell the story around it, add some color that basically makes the case that it was intentional or, you know, that the subject was involved. And I know this is in the book, but, you know, people like to go straight to the accounting records thinking that that's where the loss is. But really, it's we care about cash when we are quantifying the loss. So we had that as our concern, number one. And then number two was just going to be to do this QuickBooks analysis and just, it kind of fulfills a couple purposes. It can potentially tell the how, you know, how was the fraud perpetrated, but it also just investigates something that's been bothering the client. You know, like sometimes they just need to know, like they just need to know that you looked at it and that you followed up on a specific observation that they had. So those were our two concerns in that case. Again, pretty simple. And then our analysis was just our standard, anytime we're going to quantify a loss or quantify funds, not for the benefit of the, you know, business or the estate or what have you. We have some standard analyses that we do for that. I don't know if you want me to talk about them or if it's just like next time. We'll just save them for next time. Yeah, yeah. That's something we'll we'll dig into soon. But basically summarizing all the expenses and looking for the ones that uh, didn't benefit the business. And then, you know, the date we talked about the data that would go into that and it's pretty much just bank statements and uh, the QuickBooks backup that she used. And that's really it. I mean, it's not, that's a particularly simple example, but um, once you kind of get used to putting things through the the case planning worksheet, it's not complicated, which is why it's so awesome. I think that it's a very logical tool to take something that's typically overwhelming. You know, like we have our um, investigation games and when we were going in person and doing the case of the man cave, the tabletop game, the initial feeling and feedback I would get as I was moderating was, oh my gosh, we don't know where to start. And and people hated that. I hated that. So if you play the game, you just have to suffer through it. But because, and I talk about it, it's intentional because that is how every case begins. But, and you and I have talked about this a lot, that it will feel like Megan will come and tell us, this is what the client's concerned about. Here's the story. Here's the drama. And then we'll get to our case planning And we just start walking through those steps methodically and logically. And by the end, it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so good. (laughs) It's so true. And I've gotten way better. I used to like honestly start every case planning workshop with like, I don't know if we can help this person. Like this is a mess. (laughs) You know, like if I just were to like read your guys notes or like hear Megan's summary of the story, I'm like, Oh, but then every time by the end, you know, an hour goes by and I'm like pumped. Like, I know we can solve this. Like, they're going to love us. Right. Like something that really came out in the book, I think, is how client centric we are. So we're client centric, but also we're very particular about maintaining that standard of objectivity and independence. And so I think with the process and just 
everything we set up, it's about how is this going to affect our client? How does this better communicate with our client? How do we make sure we're on the same page with our client? And that's why we start with those client concerns. Because at the end of the day, that is our business, right? But I think it's applicable even if I work in internal audit, even if I work in internal investigations, there's still only so many resources or even law enforcement. There's only so much time. It may not be actual dollars, but so much time that can be spent on different matters. And by using risk-based analysis and then you know that bleeding over into case planning, then I can start going, okay, these are the major things I need to focus on. And then I can be very task oriented. And then now we have a process, then that makes it where we can work with a team. And then at the end of the day, we have such great client satisfaction at the end. Love it. Yeah. And like you said, even if we, even if you're in a setting where you don't have clients per se or a budget per se, everyone has stakeholders that they're ultimately trying to get the best results for and everyone has limited resources. So I think it really applies no matter what. So I agree. I love it. I love our case planning process. And I am, even though I was scared at first, I am very excited to share this with our investigative community because I'm just all about making investigations. I really think investigations can solve so many problems in the world. And obviously I'm really biased about that, but it's really just creatively solving problems and using a hypothesis and data. And I think maybe that's why if people don't know you, your background is actually in geology. And I just thought of something else. And this kind of relates to to like scientific investigations versus fraud investigations versus the other Doug amazing thing that I love about this whole case planning framework is it's a co- communication tool not just at the beginning but it's how we frame up our findings at the end and our report because like you said I think investigations can solve a lot of problems out there but also like clear communication of an investigation yes. you know what it what data was it based on? And then what were the findings is like game changing. And I think this is awesome for that. But yes, it is pretty crazy how much what we do here at Workman has in common with like scientific investigations. I was never like a long time researcher or anything, but uh, I have a geology master's degree from Penn State. So I did a thesis on rocks in Northern California. Um, and then I was a petroleum geologist for a few years. And um it's honestly like all the same thing. We basically are like frame up a question that we're asking, whether it's when did this region become mountainous or, you know, which is the best area to drill for oil and gas? And then we think about what data we need to answer it. And then we go get that data and run some analyses. So that's what we do here. We're not doing anything crazy. This (laughs) isn't like earth shattering. It's just applying a very logical framework and steps and, um, I'm excited to, in a couple of weeks, talk to you about our data standard data sleuth analyses and the data sources um, and start kind of piecing some of those things together that ultimately, yeah, you know, all of these things create the outline for our findings. And then what I think is so cool is that if someone wants to verify what we've done, they can. Like, we have nothing to hide. We're not trying to just you know, pull the wool over someone's eyes. Like you can go and recalculate this yourself. You can go find this data yourself. Which is also very scientific. Reproducibility, man. Right. Oh, you know all these great words. I'm just like, (laughs) how can I keep my business working and hire people? Um, But this is actually like a real thing. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me about this, Rachel. And um, we'll make sure, of course, once again, to link to the book. And yeah, the case plan, you got to buy the book to get the free downloads. You'll love it. You will. Thanks, Rachel. Yep. Thank you for listening to The Investigation Game. For more information on any of the topics brought up on this show, visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoyed our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also connect with us on any social media platform by searching Workman Forensics. If you have any questions or topic ideas, please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com. Thank you.